of this later. So hello, everybody. It's, it's nice to meet you, to talk to you. Maybe you've heard me talking before uh, because I gave those two other talks on, on the introduction to Bell and the introduction to Python packaging. Um, if you're here and you heard that already, then I, I applaud you for deciding on purpose to listen to me talk again. But uh, today's is not me talking. I wanna show you something very quickly. And then I'd like the whole time to be spent on discussion because we've got a lot of neat ideas coming from different directions. And Alexi's here and he's gonna give us some really good ideas from his perspectives because this, uh, this whole idea of, of doing some link prediction stuff is not specifically unique to Corona Y, it's not specifically unique to me. And there's even other people thinking about this kind of thing in task VT. Um, unfortunately, Dan couldn't join us today. Uh, he's like busy doing everything else. So, you know, he'll, he'll be able to help us whenever he's got the chance. But for the most part, we can kind of self-organize. So maybe before I start, can I get a little bit of information about everybody? Who is, um, who is a machine learning person? And who is a data scientist? If you think there's a difference between those two, please let me know. Um, who is a biologist? Who's a programmer? Who's an NLP kind of person? Maybe I get a like, little idea of, of what everyone's background is. You can either write it in the chat or turn yourself off mute and just say hi, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, I can go first. Hi, yep. uh, I'm Svetlana. Um, my handle is Kaleido Escape, and I'm coming from Natural Language Processing. Great, thanks. Maybe Alexi, you can say hi. I'm just going to go down the list if, if you want. Hi, hi. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, my name is Alexei. Uh, I have uh, some uh, machine learning background, but uh, basically, 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 it is very limited. Uh, most of uh, uh, my background is in web development. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, hey there, on. Uh, can you, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I'm Ali Heather Bangersh and I'm a team lead at Coronavai and a medical student. Uh, and I do like machine learning a lot. So despite a lot of work at, in my plate, I still wish to go with it. Yes. Thanks. It's interesting. Okay. Uh, Aman. Hi. Can you hear Hi. me? Yeah. All right, so I'm a high school student, so I don't have much experience, but I am interested in data science, and I'd like to learn more about the science side of this project, too. Great. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. You'll, you'll learn a lot. Uh, who's next? Uh, Arathana? Are you able to speak? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so uh, my name is Aradna, and my most of the experience is uh, included in uh, NLP. Uh, processing and I have a somewhat experience with other machine learning stuff too. Okay, um, Matan, could you say something about yourself, please? Sure. Um, so, my background is in business, uh, but got into uh, AI slash ML uh, about uh, uh, sixteen or eighteen months ago, and have done a few different projects on. Um, uh, image classification uh, and NLP. Cool. Uh, ben, hi. Will you say something about yourself, please? Hey. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ben Yuri. I, uh, I'm a research scientist at Harvard Medical School, and I work on uh, several systems that we've been discussing on this channel, Indra and, and Gilda, to name two. Uh, and I'm generally interested in everything that has to do with uh, AI-assisted modeling of um, biological systems, and text mining, and so on. Great. Um, Mindy, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Mindy. Um, so I have a genetics background from science. Um, learned that in college, so it's been a while. Um, so I worked in biotech for a while, then got into ML. Um, and then starting a new gig at a startup that basically uses um, NLP, like NLU, specifically BERT and XLNet um, for their clients. Um, to, so their mission statement is 
to make everyone a genius at their job. So the reason why I'm here is that I want to just keep up to date with health tech and then see what knowledge graphs are about. So, yeah. Great. Um, I think the next person is uh, Sid Mitra. Sorry if I said your name a little wrong. Um, no, no, that's fine. Actually, it's Siddhartha Mitra, so short into Sid Mitra is fine. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, I'm a, uh, I work in computational neuroscience in uh, New York City. Uh, my uh, more uh, background is like uh, I did a lot of uh, web development and uh, data analysis, but um, I'm uh, interested in uh, biology and especially machine learning. And uh, I'm part of the immunology uh, knowledge graph and uh, uh, and protein explorer uh, interface building team, which is the task VT immunology in coronavirus. So I'm very interested in this uh, topic. Great. Um... Uh, I think the next person on the list is Wendy. Would you be able to introduce yourself, please? Uh, hi, I'm Wendy. I'm uh, a mix of software engineering and ML engineering. Um, I've been working with various data-related jobs for the last five, six years. Um, I guess I'm here because I like ML in general, and I've been learning a bit more about um, graph algorithms and graph network so i find this really fascinating great i think uh, everyone from the nlp side is going to be really um like a little mind blown by the first introduction to like graph analysis because it's actually based on nlp so i think there's a couple more people uh chu kui or chu kui could you please introduce yourself uh sure so hi everyone i'm john um i am a recently graduated oh, master's sure. student and I've sort of been doing like odd jobs around for Corona Y. Um, been helping with the integration and like some of the pipeline stuff, and I'm getting started with helping with some of the ML stuff now. Um, I guess I'm here. Oh, you might have cut out, or it's me. I think he cut out. Sorry, we can't hear you anymore. He muted his. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, where did I mute myself from? Like right after you said hi. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so, um, hi, I'm John. I've been mostly just doing um, odd jobs around Corona Y. Mostly been doing like integration stuff uh, with a lot of help from Charlie and then getting started with the machine learning stuff. Um, my, my background is between ML and computer science. I, my master's was mostly focused on machine learning and my undergrad was mostly computer science. So yeah, I'm just here and looking to help. Great. Um, did I miss somebody? Did everyone get a chance to say hi? Okay. Um, that was really nice. Thanks everyone for introducing yourself. So we've got a lot of people from the NLP side, a couple of people who have done other kinds of AI machine learning. And of course, you know, you could be an AI machine learning person working in NLP. Um, I, I'm really interested to get Mindy's perspective because she's got a background in genetics and, and maybe she can uh, also give a lot of insight uh, from, from her, her past life. So, okay, uh, just let me know, can you all see the, uh, the slides? because I'm gonna go through, I got about 10 slides. I ripped them all out of my PhD uh, defense. So I didn't even have to take much time because I've got the good 20 minute introduction, but we're gonna try and do it in 15. So, um, you know, I always start by telling people about drug discovery and, and sort of motivating the biological problem. And if you're not working in this field, maybe you're not aware of how big of a problem uh, drug discovery is and how long it takes and how expensive it is. So uh, every year or so, there's, there's a couple of groups that give an estimate on how much it costs to make a drug all the way from the beginning to the end. And that's what this, uh, this picture is showing is all the different parts of that process from target identification to target validation, and then all the way into the end of clinical trials. And if you're not familiar with the biology or the chemistry, maybe you've at least heard of clinical trials. Right now, very important topic. We're listening to all of the different um, drugs and, and vaccines that are going into these clinical trials where they test if things are safe, you know, if they're not toxic to, to ingest and to go through your bloodstream and to get excreted. 
And then, you know, after you know that it's safe, you can give it to sick people and see if it fixes them or treats them. Yeah, fixes is a, is a very high bar. Um, this, this process is very expensive. The first parts, the target identification, validation, and target to hit usually cost the first, you know, 800 million. Um, the, the little bits in the middle, preclinical and weight optimization probably cost another 400 million. And clinical trials are also costing like almost a billion. So if you add it all up for every drug that makes it from the beginning to the end, you may have spent more than $2 billion. Um, and, and this isn't an easy, fast process either. One of the, the issues is that there's a lot of attrition and a lot of things fail. So, so you have to put a lot in on the left side to get anything out on the right. And um, clinical trials take quite a long time. Uh, right now, during the pandemic, this is an issue because we really need to have drugs that we know are safe and work fast. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of ways of getting around the, the parts where you have to test people and you have to check to make sure that things actually work. So, so this process also takes you know, between 10 and 15 years. Um, we're going to try and get around a lot of the problems that make it take so long. And we want to skip all this stuff in the beginning. We want to skip target identification and validation and hit to lead and lead optimization and preclinical. And, and sometimes we want to go right to the end where we go to clinical trials. And, and we're going to use a special trick called drug repositioning to do that. And, and then we're also going to try and solve a different scientific challenge, which is the part that's all the way on the left, which is target identification. So, so the two ideas are, how do we pick drugs that already exist and then use them for something new, like teaching a dog a new trick? And then the, the other thing that I think will be interesting for us to work on together is to identify what's causing the disease, uh, what's important for treating the disease, which proteins or which parts of the biology do we need to modulate with, with chemicals or with you know, vaccines? So there's lots of you know, novel, uh, sorry, not novel, like exotic things that we could do. But maybe we'll stick to the simple stuff first and then we can branch out. So, so I, always, I like to find, frame this as the triangle. Um, we have networks that, that are describing biology on the molecular level and, and a lot of times connecting it to the phenotypic level. And so for us and for a lot of scientists that are doing drug discovery, we really want to know the relationship between these three things. Chemicals, which are the things that could potentially be drugs. Targets, which usually is talking about proteins within the cells, the proteins that bind to each other, that do lots of interesting things and, and cause higher level processes, which eventually lead to phenotypes. And, and you know, some of these phenotypes are, are diseases, and some of them are symptoms of diseases, and some of them are side effects of, of bad molecules and, and stuff going wrong. Um, the idea is we want to unravel this triangle. We want to understand all of the relationships between things which chemicals jobs are to, to target different proteins, which proteins are important within diseases. This is a lot of the work that we're doing right now with text mining is building up these networks. Um, and then also which chemicals have been used to treat diseases because in the end, you know, you want to give somebody a pill or a, an IV and then treat them. <clears throat> so, so when we have networks that describe all of these things and how they're related, we actually uh, can talk about these biological tasks that are, that are dealing with drug discovery from the last slide. And, and the most interesting one that I, I started with is this idea of drug discovery, like picking the chemical to phenotype, which chemical is going to stop a disease or, or lessen it usually. And that's called drug discovery. And in the very special case, when a chemical has already been tested in the clinic before, and it's already been found to be safe because it was used for some other disease, um, if we can figure out that chemical is actually useful for a new phenotype, treating a new disease, we call that drug repositioning because that lets us skip the entire first part of this last diagram, all the yellow part we can skip. We could go right to the red part at the end. Um, you know, when you have uh, phenotypes that you want to avoid as well, you, you might want to see that, a, you might want to predict that a chemical is going to have effects that are, are bad, like give you a headache or make your hair fall out. And, and this is called toxicology. So, so depending on the kind of chemical or phenotype, this is called a couple different things. Um, you know, this is a really tried and true thing that the, the drug uh, industry and the pharmaceutical industry has worked on is, is which chemicals are used for which proteins, which can modify the activity. Usually what happens is you've got a protein. Maybe you remember this from high school biology class. You've got a protein and then the chemical comes in and it sits inside it and the protein does something. Um, and what we want to do is put chemicals in that can mess with those proteins, either causing them to stop working or make them work even more. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm glossing over the very specifics of the biology. We can talk about all the specifics a little bit later. 
because it's quite a bit. Um, anyway, the idea of picking the right chemical to, to target a protein, and if, if you're not familiar to this moment, you know, I keep using the word target because we're talking about the action that the chemicals do to the proteins. Um, that's, that's the kind of prediction that we want to make, which is called proteochemometrics. Um, and that's a fancy word that I think the, the group from uh, University of Leiden coined. One sec, I think there was a chat. No, no check. Okay. Um, okay. And then the last part, which uh, we're, we're going to work on together is target prioritization. And this is the task of figuring out which edges aren't in our graph between phenotypes and targets that should be. Um, the idea is that we may know a little bit about important proteins in a given disease. And we want to use that information to predict which other ones might be important either based on their position within the network or based on the similarity of the chemicals that interact with those targets or based on the similarity of uh, those targets' importance in other diseases. The cool thing about the knowledge graph approach and about these techniques is that we're going to actually use knowledge graphs describing not just coronavirus um, pathology and coronavirus targets, but we're gonna look at all sorts of different ones at the same time. Some of them might be metabolic diseases, some of them may be neurodegenerative diseases, some might be, you know, pick one, uh, yeah, cardiovascular. Um, and, and we're gonna be able to use machine learning to find the patterns, and, and those patterns are gonna help us make predictions that are useful for our, our specific case. And then, you know, the last part is that we're going to try and do the scientific interpretation. So, so to make this a little more concrete, because I, I do a lot of hand waving, uh, let me give you an example of a chemical, a target, and a phenotype. I'm sure all of you have, um, you know, hit your knee or something and hurt yourself before. And a very common thing to take uh, when you've got, you know, muscle pain or joint pain is aspirin. And, you know, in, in our knowledge graph, which if you're not a biologist, you have a very small biology knowledge graph in your head, but you know that aspirin is useful for pain. Um, and, and that's good because what we can do is use a network to describe actually what causes aspirin to do its job. It turns out that aspirin is inhibiting a protein, uh, actually a, a complex of two proteins called cyclooxygenases one and two. We've got this pretty picture of two proteins, the blue and the uh, green one coming together. And uh, yeah, so aspirin stops this, this protein cyclooxygenase from doing its job, which uh, from a very high level, the job of this protein is to make pain signals. So, um, yeah, it tells it to stop doing that and then you don't have as much pain. So this is kind of our complete knowledge graph. We've got a chemical, a protein, a phenotype, and we know how all of them are connected. Well, we're gonna take all the information about these things that we know and we're gonna push it to help us understand new biology because we don't always have all these connections. Sometimes we're missing the edge between a chemical and a phenotype and that's when we wanna do drug discovery. Sometimes we don't understand what causes a chemical to treat uh, a given phenotype. Then we want to do something like proteochemometrics. And then sometimes we, we don't know what's relevant for the disease at all. And, and then we're going to have to do target prioritization. This is the trickiest part. Okay, so we're 22 minutes in. Everybody's kind of given some background on, on their interest in machine learning. And I've told you a little bit about the biological problem and about the graphs. It's time to connect the graphs and the biology to the machine learning and the techniques that can actually try and help us solve these problems that we presented. And the first one I want to tell you about is called network representation learning. There's a couple terms we're going to use for, for similar tasks like this, and, and we can get into the minutia later. But the job of network representation learning is to take a graph or a network, depending on which word you like better, and to assign for each node a vector within Euclidean space. Sometimes even they go outside of Euclidean space, but that's minutia. Um, because machine learning is pretty hard on, on graph data structures, but everyone's familiar with doing machine learning on a vector and, and a matrix full of vectors for different things. And once you've got a vector for each node, you can do stuff like clustering. You can do stuff like classifier training. You can uh, even do the task which is specific for the network, which is link prediction. And then there's this other one, which we won't really get into uh, because it's not on the biology side, but it's also interesting is doing entity disambiguation because sometimes two nodes actually should be one node, but they're not. 
and uh, there's also ways to identify those and prioritize them. Um, okay, I, I just realized um, that I speak very fast. If I'm speaking too fast, please somebody uh, message and say, slow down, okay? <laughs> I remember uh, some, somebody told me that last time and I didn't realize it. Oh, I found the chat, good. All right, so network representation takes our, our graph and it turns it into vectors so we can down, do downstream machine learning. And, and one of the things it's possible then is link prediction. And I just told you that if we have a graph that's missing some links, making a prediction of what should be there can help us solve our biological problems directly because we have our triangle and predicting links for each part of the triangle is a different biology task. So let's look at a specific algorithm that actually generates these vectors. Then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we can turn those vectors into the link prediction task. And then, you know, I hope in, in about seven minutes we can we can start discussion about what you guys think and then how we might want to apply this and some ideas that we have uh, to, to do this kind of on our graphs. So uh, I promised that there'd be some natural language processing. Maybe some of you are familiar with the Skipgram model and with word to vec Yeah, I, I, I guess there's not a lot of uh, people, but maybe there's some nods. Um, so, so one of the first network representation learning uh, methods was very simple. It took a knowledge, uh, a knowledge graph or just a network, and then it did random walks from each node. And so the idea is that you start with, um, you start at a node and you look at all the edges that it has. You follow one of the edges, and then you look at all the edges that one has and you follow it. And you do this until you've got, you know, a walk that has a length of three or four, maybe five. And you do this over and over and over for all of your nodes within the graph. And then you put it into a language model. Now the job of the Skipgram language model is to uh, assign vectors to words. And it assigns similar vectors to words that occur within a similar context. Well, it turns out that the community structure within a network, which nodes are close to each other, and which nodes are connected to the same nodes, has very similar properties to words occurring in sentences. So as wild as it sounds, generating these, these blocks from a, a graph and putting it into a language model and considering the walk as a sentence and the node as a word allows you to get vectors the same way you'd get vectors for words using the language model. And, and then apply it the same way you'd apply a language model. Because once you've got the vectors, you can do all sorts of things. Um, this was, for me, very surprising when I learned about this the first time. I, it almost is, is counterintuitive how a, a natural language processing technique can be used to solve a problem that has nothing to do with language at all. Um, yeah, so, so I was really interested. This, this is an old algorithm. This was written in 2014, and there's been lots of different improvements because people have lots of ideas and what if we generate walks differently? What if we try and include more information? Um, you know, one of the caveats of this method is it doesn't really know the difference between different kinds of nodes. It doesn't know about the directions of edges or about the different kinds of edges. So there's lots of room for improvement from this first algorithm. And um, you know, what, what happens is the, the nice parallel between random walks and um, natural language processing, that kind of falls apart as you start to get into the specifics of knowledge graphs. But you know what? That's okay. It's nice to start somewhere simple. And, and uh, this very common graph, for example, is called the karate graph that's, that's on the right side of this page. And you know, the, the job was to make vectors for each node. And once you do that, you can embed those vectors in very low dimensional space. So you can see that a graph gets turned into a 2D vector space. And um, you have to take my word for it, but this karate graph is a really interesting example because it's about different dojos where people go and, and train for karate. And it's about the students and the uh, instructors. And the different colors represent different dojos. So you can see that those are kind of labeled in the original graph and they're really obvious clusters. Even just in two dimensions, you can see those clusters in the embedding. So we're already in a really good spot. We can make really meaningful vectors describing our nodes. And if we wanted to do downstream tasks like clustering or classifiers, we're already in a good situation. I'm gonna come back to the link prediction thing in one second. I wanna show you how we can use these kind of vectors to solve our first biological task, which is target prioritization. So um, 
The idea is if you have a, a network and you're not talking about uh, different people in dojos, but all of your nodes are proteins and the connections between them are interactions between those proteins, you can do the same game. You can generate a vector for each protein. And uh, this is what I'm showing you right now on this slide. And, and once you generate the vector for each protein, you also uh, can do the classification task. Now, remember we were talking about uh, target prioritization, where we want to know if a given protein is relevant for a given disease. We want to know the link between those two things. Well, if we train a logistic regression classifier or any other binary classifier that you like, logistic regression is simple and it works, so we leave it at that. If you know for a given disease, what are the proteins that are interesting, you can train that classifier, binary classifier, to predict new interesting proteins because interesting proteins for that disease, the associated proteins, they get to be ones, all the other ones get to be zeros, you train, and then you make predictions. There's a little bit of a machine learning trick in here called positive unlabeled learning, because we only have positive examples. A lot of times we don't know which proteins are not interesting. So, so maybe you've come across a task like this in machine learning before. With knowledge graphs, we also have the same kind of problem. Most of our knowledge graphs are just about knowledge that we know is true and not knowledge that we know is false. So anyway, with this technique, we can, we can, for a given disease and the set of proteins that we know are important for that disease, we can train a classifier on these vectors based on the protein-protein interaction network and start predicting which new proteins might be relevant just based on the structure of the protein-protein interaction network. So I can't go into all the details of this, this actually just got accepted after the most awful review ever for like a year and a half. And uh, yeah, you, you can all read this paper. I'll send you a link to it if you'd like. Um, but anyway, I'd like to just uh, remind you, this is, this is an example. So this kind of thing works. The, oh, I had two slides for that. Okay. Um, the other example that I have, and I, I lied when I said this was gonna take seven minutes. So I'm gonna make this really fast. This example is about, um, doing link prediction, not just for a single disease, but we wanna do kind of joint link prediction. We wanna be able to understand for all the diseases and all the proteins, what are the relationships? So this is better to think of as a link prediction task instead of as lots and lots of binary classified classification tasks. Um, so the trick is, if you have embeddings for nodes and you wanna make embeddings for edges, you take the embedding for a pair of nodes and then you do some math, you pick a math formula that takes in those two nodes vectors and spits out a vector for the edge between those two nodes. And when you have a network, you know which, um, which edges exist and you know which edges don't exist. So you, you can say the ones that do exist get a plus and the ones that don't exist get a, a minus or a one and a zero. And then you train a, a binary classifier for edges. Should that edge exist or should it not exist? There's a couple different math formulas for how to combine vectors together. The simplest one's called the Hadamard operator, which means that you just multiply the pairwise entities together. It turns out that one actually works the best. So, um, yeah, when you do this, you actually get interesting stuff. It's not just uh, giving you interesting, you know, AUC, ROC values, but we were able to do this on a network that, that could tell us a little bit about Parkinson's disease and you know, chemicals which might be related to its side effects. So yeah, I won't go into that specifically, but you know, we wanna make pictures and we wanna convey our results in the end when we do this kind of machine learning. This is a really important part. All right, that's the end of, of the presentation that I was giving, so it took 20 minutes. I guess that's okay, it was 11 slides. Um, and now I wanna sort of open up discussion and, and I hope you all had the chance to follow along in here and you can click on these links. Uh, there's two different documents that I prepared before. The first one is this Corona Y Bell tasks. Now this, this one's probably a little bit less relevant for, for our group because this is all of the different things that we could be doing for not just um, analysis of knowledge graphs, but also the generation and some other things. So the top is a little bit um, like technical. It's a little bit database and developer heavy. But as we get to the bottom of this document, it's starting to outline some of the uh, interesting scientific challenges that we could, oh yeah, here we go hypothesis generation with link prediction. So our interesting scientific goals. And, and I have written down in case, yeah, I did talk a little fast, so I apologize. But the important part is written here, um, the, the ideas from the top. And yeah, I outlined those a little bit. 
And then we come down to some of the methods that we could use to solve these problems and how we could use our knowledge graphs to, to actually do some of these tasks. And eventually the goal is to make predictions for what proteins are important for the coronavirus and, uh, and COVID-19, and then which uh, chemicals maybe are interesting. And on top of that, we don't want to just make predictions from a black box machine learning system, but we're actually going to use the knowledge graph to make explanations. So I'd like to ask everyone to, to kind of join in the conversation now. I think that's, that's the end of, of the presentation. Oh, there's, there's one other thing though, maybe before, before I open it up, uh, there's one more slide. There's, there's a, a specific machine learning library that, that I've been working on that we're going to use for this task. And uh, we actually just uh, published it today on archive. Um, though we need to get a certain number of stars on GitHub to, <laughs> to submit it to the journal we want to. So I would appreciate if you guys got the chance to, to click on that link and star our repository on GitHub. But you know, besides that, um, I think, I think the, the things that we should discuss right now is for people who, who don't understand the task so much, if they want to know a little bit more um, on the scientific side. For, for you who are, are becoming new to <clears throat> knowledge graph embeddings and, and to natural language, uh, so for, sorry, network representation learning, which, which sometimes we interchange with knowledge graph embeddings. <clears throat> we can talk a little bit about that methodology. Um, and then my idea was to give everybody the chance who wants to sort of a space to do the hello, room, hello world uh, program for knowledge graph embeddings. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to, to get started actually using some of these techniques and to get something interesting. Um, so everyone who wants to start from zero is going to get the chance to do that. And then, yeah, so, so I showed you this first document that had like all of the tasks that I could imagine. And on the right side, I have kind of a project outline for if we all want to work together to create sort of a holistic package, like a, a little research project where we can try doing this for a small network, a medium network, and then a large network. And we can use a couple different methodologies. Then we can apply them to our, our disease area and, and see what we get. And then we can you know, discuss and we can come up with ideas. And then the last part, we, we have to come back to um, doing a little bit of biological explanation. But if you do all these things together, you can actually publish an academic paper. Uh, maybe some of you have published papers before in academia. Some of you are in high school, which is awesome. This is going to be a cool experience. Some of you might be um, master's students or PhDs, maybe some bachelors. And then for everybody else who's, who's been in academia at some point or left, you know, this is still kind of a fun exercise. So uh, it would be neat to look forward to writing a nice little paper. Maybe we could submit to a, a conference or, or if we do it really well, we can submit to a journal. And that might be a really neat way to show that Corona why, um, you know, unmanagement system works. I really like this, this phrase they were using the other day. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to let all of you talk and I'm just going to listen until I have an answer to one of your questions. So does anyone want to start? I sure. can start. Oh, go for it. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, first of all. Really nice presentation. Um, and so uh, maybe I just kind of like missed something, but basically um, you started out with uh, discussing, you know, graph embeddings and uh, representation learning over graphs. And to me, it seems like there's this uh, assumption that is built into this uh, discussion, which is that the graph already exists. <laughs> Yes. So I'm curious about how uh, that first step of actually building the graph, uh, your, your, your opinions on that. Okay, Th there's a couple of really good places where we are at. The first is that we've got Alexi on the line. Maybe you want to answer this question and then I can piggyback on whatever you, you said. Uh, you, you want me to, 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 to answer me the question about uh, graph generation? Well, we're, we're making graphs in your group. so. It's, uh, or if you don't want me to put you on the spot, I can I can answer instead. No, no, we we we, we are working with Svetlana together on uh, graph generation. As, so as, I, as, I as, as, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as far as uh, I can understand, uh, there are three ways 
to get a uh, chronograph first. Uh, way is just to use uh, existing graph, right? That was uh, built uh, by other groups manually or uh, with some tools. And we have uh, such graphs for COVID-19, right? And for other diseases. Second uh, way we could use uh, structured uh, databases, knowledge bases, like gene bank, uh, and uh, last most complicated way is uh, built graph from uh, literature, from scientific corpus. For example, from Corp 19 uh, that I said. Yeah. So, so the good news is, is your stream is working towards that very difficult goal in the end of, of using the Corp 19 data set to build these graphs. Um, we already have a lot of experience. So I, I've got a lot to, to give where we can start with knowledge graphs that cover lots of different areas of biology. Uh, a big part of my PhD was about putting together these big data sets. And, and now my, my job is also building massive knowledge graphs that describe a lot of different kinds of biology. So um, I, have, I have some scientific references for that. But, but yeah, Alexi hit it on the head. We, we have a lot of databases that exist already. Um, ben, ben Giori is on the line from, from Harvard Medical School. And they also have the ability to deliver us an incredibly large text mind um, system that also includes not just text mining, but also structured databases with um, what I think of as the secret sauce from theirs is this um, confidence uh, scoring for all of the edges that are added to the network as well, based on a combination of, of what resource it came from and, and uh, this different levels of specificity, because we also you know, see very high granularity and very low granularity in the networks and the edges that we get from different sources. Ben, do you want to say something to that? Uh, yeah, I think this is a more general remark about kind of conceptually about what networks uh, to use. So um, the, the things that we are working on, both with text mining and with, with collecting uh, um, mechanisms from pathway databases and other structured sources, uh, really focuses on causal and directional relationships. So A phosphorylates B, A activates B, A increases the amount of B, and so on. Um, network representation learning doesn't necessarily use that information or require that information. You can, you can do network representation learning with a simple association graph with undirected edges where you can say something like uh, headache is associated with aspirin and it's a valid, valid, uh, valid link. Um, so um, I think what we are producing is particularly useful for explanations for constructing mechanistic explanations for why a given drug works the way it does. Uh, like, uh, uh, you know, why does hydroxychloroquine inhibit SARS-CoV-2 in vitro? Uh, uh, we could, with, with, with the kinds of mechanisms that we reconstruct, uh, answer questions like that. Whereas for network representation learning, uh, you might be able to actually pick up a lot of uh, non-causal associational information um, uh, that helps you learn a good representation, right? And so there's a distinction between these two things, I think. Yeah, I'm on the same page as Ben with this one. I think that we, we have the ability to incorporate lots of information in, uh, in, in this network representation learning world. You, you don't necessarily care about the types of edges. And, and the only difference to the knowledge graph embedding world is then you do start to model the types of edges and, and differences between them. So it may be possible right. to actually make predictions like this protein increases that protein yeah. versus this protein decreases that protein. So, so I would, I, maybe one approach could be to, so I, so I think as far as the, the graph used for network representation learning goes, we can pretty liberally dump stuff in there because it's robust to, it's robust to a lot of, a uh, lot of uh, things. And then, use that for initial discovery. And then once that highlights a certain set of associations that could be relevant, then we could look at a more precise, directed, mechanistic uh, model and try to explain those, right? And 
uh, I, I think that's Charlie what you had in mind. Yes, this is exactly well. what I had in mind. Thank you. Um, uh, Charlie, one more thing. John is trying to get in on the call and his, you have to let him in, I think. Oh, bummer. Okay, got it. Thank you. Good, he should be in. All right, yeah, and, and uh, so, so the way I was thinking is that I have a couple drafts that are prepared. Um, there's the one that is a very small one that we can use as a pilot because um, one of the problems with these methods is they do become a little intensive computationally. So when we start with small graphs that, that have a lot of information about the chemistry, you can maybe run those on your laptops and then we can, we can scale up to other medium sized graphs that have been published for similar tasks like drug repositioning. Um, one of them is called the HedioNet. Another one is uh, a recent improvement to the HedioNet called the drug repositioning knowledge graph. And then the, the biggest scale up would be to see what kind of combination of the, the dump from text mining from Indra and, and also a lot of these structured databases where, where we could go, you know, maybe two orders of magnitude bigger than these other knowledge graphs, I think, if we start using these. So, so that's that's a down the road, if we if we get that far and we, we're all really working towards this goal, we can use these supersized graphs. Um, otherwise, there's, there's smarter ways that we can cut them up. And, and make them a little bit more amenable to, to play time. Yeah, this is play time for now. Do you have um, a way of measuring the accuracy or quality of a knowledge graph? This or correctness? A, yeah, this is a little tricky. Um, there's a lot of different things that we, we've done in, in different communities for, for the correctness of graphs. Um, John, John made a smirk, so I bet he's got an idea on this, but uh, I actually wrote something very technical solution to this that I, I conveyed to Alexi is one of them is um, finding edges that are sort of redundant of each other and ones that are uh, inverses of each other. And, and when it comes to network representation learning, you have to actually split your, your graph into a, a testing and a training set before doing machine learning tasks. And you want to make sure that edges that are highly correlated don't uh, end up in both the training and the testing sets because then you're gonna get a uh, unfair evaluation because if you have really obvious correlations, then you just make that prediction every time. Um, so, so that's a, like a very shallow explanation of, of that issue. Uh, John, did you have an idea you wanted to say? Uh, well, <clears throat> um, at the level, it's, an, it's sort of an interesting question. I mean, one way to look at it is, trying to evaluate uh, the correctness of individual edges, right? And this is one of the things that we've been working on in Indra for a long time by looking at overlaps uh, between different readers and relationships between different types of statements uh, at different levels of specificity. Um, this is implemented in the Indra belief engine. Um, uh, recently, we've been doing some manual curation uh, to put together a data set you know, where we can evaluate the uh, performance of different probability models for estimating the precision of different statements, right? So statements that are extracted um, from one sentence by one reader are much more likely to be, you know, technical errors, reading errors, uh, than statements that are corroborated by many readers, many sentences, and curated databases, right? So. Uh, and then the role of the model is to sort of figure out what the shape of that curve is for everything in between. So we have, uh, we're actually right now in, uh, engaged in, you know, testing different models uh, and we can apply different models um, over the Indra knowledge graph at least. But, you know, I think the question of uh, reliability of a knowledge graph is essentially a sort of a broader, <laughs> yeah. it encompasses many other types of, um, issues other than just the reliability of reading systems and things like that and it extends to conflicts and contradictions and completeness of the knowledge graph relative to the domain and a whole bunch of other considerations that we could probably have a whole separate discussion on another time. Yeah, just one other thing that we're, we're already doing better than they were 10 years ago because one of the predominant kind of computational biology or bioinformatics analytical techniques is based on what's called a pathway. and if you ask five biologists what a pathway is, you're going to get six different answers. And, and unfortunately, all the pathways are just predefined bits of a network that describes how things are connected. And, and at least we're, we're not dealing with this problem of having a very biased boundary to where the network ends. 
I would like to add some words. Uh, I think for, for us, uh, for me, for Svetlana and other uh, people that are working with us on knowledge graph generation on uh, NLP pipeline, this is a very specific uh, question because let's imagine, okay, we success, have success, we uh, built uh, chronology graph from court 19 how we uh, could understand that this is uh, chronology graph is uh, good or good enough we would like to have some uh, metric some some point some uh, some number that uh, uh, that uh, would say to us that we we done well. Yeah, I, I think John and Ben's approach might be the most appropriate one for analyzing the the goodness of the text mining that. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that. Uh, of course, you could evaluate uh, accuracy of uh, named entity recognition. You could evaluate it. You have to, obviously. You have to evaluate uh, accuracy of uh, relation extraction, but uh, in the same time, I realize that uh, there are uh, several ways to build uh, knowledge graph with mm -hmm. uh, with uh, one one set of uh, relations, and I thought I thought that Bell uh, biological expression language was designed with idea of uh, uh, computational purpose, no? Yeah, for, for some kind of reasoning over, over data that you might be measuring also from, from a cell or a, yeah, this kind of thing. But and, and, and that's why we use well, because it defines how it should be, right? Yeah, for, for a certain set of tasks, you know, you know, Bell, Bell was kind of in the middle between being a formalism for graphs and also being a, a data structure that's useful for analysis. It kind of sits right in the middle. There's also data structures that aren't very useful for analysis that might be more useful for storing uh, certain kinds of biology. And there's also analytical uh, data structures that are totally useless for storing stuff that you get out of text mining. And, and there's this whole spectrum. And, and I actually steal John's slide every time I want to explain this. Well, I didn't steal a slide, I made it myself, but the, the explanation I stole from him. Nice. Um, okay. so, so yeah, I, I think we could I, do I a lot just, of this. I just, yeah. I'll say just one final thing in response to Alexi. I mean, you're right that when, you know, the NLP community has all these different ways of measuring precision and recall of a reading system and you could test the different components, just like you say. Um, the way that we, it's worth noting that the way that we evaluate reading systems is, is sort of particular in the sense that, um, so if you have a supervised reading system, often what you're doing is you have a bunch of sentences and then you have the sort of target extractions from those sentences. And then if you don't get a some kind of match, then you score it as, you know, if you get a match to what was in the training data set, you score it as, you know, right or wrong, and then you use that to generate your precision recall. Um, and one of the problems with that approach is that uh, sometimes the reading systems can get something that is sort of defensible from the sentence, but isn't, it's not, it's because there's a matching problem between what's in the data set and, and, and what all the things that could be extracted from that sentence. So that's actually a tricky problem. So what we do when we evaluate reading systems is we go back and manually, we look at every extraction and then we look at the sentence and we say, <laughs> not is this the correct interpretation of the sentence, but is it not incorrect in the sense that does this sentence provide justification for this extraction? So it's actually, a, it's a more lax or minimal standard, right? Because readers that, that sort of ha have a lower bar in terms of the specificity that they're trying to produce will, will score higher in that sense, potentially. But, um, you know, that being said, I think that's the most relevant uh, metric in terms of what a scientist is looking for. They see an extraction, they want to know, okay, does this have any basis in the literature? And if I look at the sentence, will this sentence 
tell me that you know support that this support this extraction that the machine got um, so that's how we score things uh, and we you know we can score different readers on that basis and we have we have scores now for you know four or five different readers so that's it in terms of like the does the system work or not that could be an evaluation that we could do for the system that you guys are putting together as well okay. oh, um sorry if you got more to add to that i have like some some kind of time-based notes because we've got about six minutes left and i have a question for everybody but go ahead ben uh, I, all i wanted to say is that i, I think uh, some of the discussion was about uh, edge level correctness but in terms of more um, uh, network level correctness. I mean, the network representation learning can be benchmarked by, for instance, uh, removing known existing edges and then trying to predict them and looking at the statistics of how that works and so on, right? So it's so there are actually ways of uh, talking about network level uh, correctness. Um, uh, and I, I actually think that network representation learning should be fairly robust to a certain error rate in edge level incorrect information. So good. Let me let me segue out of that because I'm as a an MC for meetings, notorious for saying, "Eh, it was supposed to be an hour, but let's keep talking anyway." So I, I want to make sure that we have some closure at the end of this one hour. So we have five minutes left, and. I think that we did something very, very important, and it was really good discussion started by Svetlana, that to do any downstream analysis, we always have to talk about what are the networks, where do they come from, and how are we going to get them. So I hope everybody's learned a little bit about the kind of stuff that we're going to be able to pull in. Of course, there's more to talk about, and, um, and we didn't quite get to the, the meat of, of this network representation learning and, and you know, really how we're going to do it. Maybe you've got an idea at this point on what kind of tasks we might want to solve and, and how we're going to think about that from the biological perspective. Um, I was thinking that in our first meeting, we might get the chance to start talking about how we do some of this stuff. But I think as we come to the end of the hour, it might be good to ask the question, um, is everyone motivated by this? Is this something you might want to learn a little bit more about the methodology, especially in light of, of the end of that conversation, Ben tying it up in a nice little bow for us. But this is a technique that it's sort of robust to some of the issues we may be facing um, in, in the earlier steps. So I just want to get a little bit of a sense from everybody. Uh, do we want to continue this conversation another time? Like uh, maybe we, we do this meeting again next week at the same time. Um, and, and that gives a chance to start. Everybody can, can be a little more fresh. Maybe you can read over the slides one more time. If you want, I can send you lots of information in the meantime. Um, and then maybe next week, we can we can talk about hello worlds of network representation learning. I feel like if everyone gets the chance to like do it and they, they can write the code and see like, wow, I've, I've got it. The, the machine learning model, it's in my hands. It, it gets my graph, it learns something about it. It predicts my edges. I mean, once you see that and you have the power and you realize that it's like a six line thing, you're gonna feel really good. And then you're gonna wanna solve the biology problem. So everyone said yes. Is is the same time next week, okay? Should I do yeah. it? All right. So, it's a little bit of a bummer because I know there's some colleagues in, in other parts of the world where it's not a really convenient time at this moment. Like the Australia guys are not joining a, a seven o'clock meeting in Germany time. Um, okay, but we're, we're recording and, and then Next week, we're going to do this meeting, I think, a second time, so, so it's a little more convenient for everybody. I don't mind doing the same meeting twice. For, for groups that are working internationally, I think this has worked pretty well. Um, yeah. So any, any like, final thoughts? Did you I, I, would like to, I would like to say uh, thank you for, uh, for your efforts, for your presentation. Uh, I think this is really amazing. This is just my um, main motivation to work on uh, Clonage Graph is a, a hope to build a hypothesis generation system, some reasoning system. Uh, frankly, I'm most interested in uh, vaccine development because I believe that really <laughs> vaccines are, are more important than drugs <laughs> in our current situation. 
but as far as I can understand, uh, on this stage there is uh, no difference between uh, vaccines or drugs. Anyway, we have some uh, knowledge graph, and anyway, we would like to build some representation, some embedding, right? Great. Um, so I actually made a, a Slack thread for this um, based on the way the other groups did it that were sub parts of the task VT. It's a private one. So if everybody sends me a message and says, hi, add me to the chat, I'll do that. And then we can continue this conversation there. And then when people ask to get involved with us or they just want to learn more, we can also pull them in and that can be a central place for, for that. And then I'm also going to figure out where some of the other people in Corona Y are, are keeping their information. Right now it's a little bit um, hard to figure that stuff out for, for me, especially. Uh, so, so we'll do our best to share everything. So I'll send everybody the links one more time. Um, yeah, my, my name is Charles Hoyt, or, or on, on Slack, it's Charlie Hoyt. So just, uh, just message me on Slack. So I've, I've got your name as well there. Sound good, everybody? I really appreciate everybody joining. I'm, I'm really excited to work with all of you because uh, everyone's gonna have really good ideas because they have no idea what they're doing. I'm sure of that. Um, yeah, so I appreciate your time. I'm looking forward to doing this again next week. So uh, we'll, let's have some nice chats in the middle. Message me, ask me questions, and then we can all learn something. And then, uh, yeah, we get working. Thank so, you, thank you very much. Thank you very we'll, much. I'll leave it at that, thank say you. goodbye, and then I'll post this video for everybody uh, also. Thank you.